Hello and welcome to Experian's Weekly Data Talk, a show where we talk to data science leaders from around the world. Today, we're actually talking about a very, very important topic. In fact, Kristen, this is one of those topics that we get in our data science community on Facebook all the time. Uh, people are wondering, how do I get started working in data science? And it's probably the most prevalent question, the most asked question. So I am super excited to have you as our guest. Um, folks, we're talking to Kristen Kerrer. She's a senior data scientist at Constant Contact. She got her BS in mathematics from Dartmouth, and then she went on to earn her master's of science in statistics. She has been working in the field for a long time, uh, very active on LinkedIn, answering people's questions. It's an honor to have you, Kristen, as our guest today. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here. <laughs> And also what's real cool is uh, our Data Talk series finally got approved on iTunes. So if you're interested in subscribing on iTunes, you can now go to ex.pn slash data talk and you can find the podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Spotify, et cetera. It's all there. Um, so that's very, very exciting. So um, before we get started, Kristen, can you kind of share with us your journey that led you to begin working as a data scientist? Yeah, so I mean, it's it's probably a long journey, right? Because I, I finished my bachelor's degree in 2004, which was a little before the, you know, term was coined data scientist. Mm -hmm. um, and I didn't, I didn't know that I was going to go into data science. I knew that I didn't want to be a teacher. I tried a couple of different things and I found myself in a role that was, uh, didn't have a ton of job opportunity for me in terms of growth. And so we're, you know, still not at the point where data science is really a term, but I had seen that people were successful who had a background in statistics. Um, you know, I saw a lot of job opportunities for statisticians and uh, people who could build models. And so I decided to go back and get my master's degree in statistics. And, you know, this was it was like a very interesting time too, because this is like 2007, 2008, the bubble, the housing bubble is about to mm. burst. I'm working in um, doing like financy things for a real estate company. And so job security wasn't looking so good. And it just seemed like the right time to go and hide in academia. <laughs> and so they, um, you know, I, I got my master's degree from WPI and the fact, faculty there was very good about helping me to get a job after I finished. And so I originally had thought that I wanted to be a uh, community college teacher or something, you know, uh, but this mm. job came around that my my professors um, suggested to me, they said, hey, do you want to go do um, econometric time series analysis for NSTAR? And, you know, sure, that sounds cool. So I was building, you know, neural nets to forecast hourly electric load. And uh, that was used for, you know, capacity planning during heat waves like it was imperative that they were able to use the output of that model to determine how they were going to allot capacity and, and how we were going to keep everybody's lights on um, and mm. you know I, I built a lot of um, time series analysis models using ARIMA predominantly and that has been you know so valuable throughout my career any job that I've worked at afterwards has wanted to know how trends are um, trending over time and how can we forecast that and sort of what insights can can we gain from that. Uh, so I highly suggest anybody who has the opportunity to learn time series analysis. Um, but from there, I realized that there was a whole world of analytics and that I was taking part in just one small piece. Like I was building cool models, um, but it was one small piece. And so I moved to the more broader um, analytics area where, you know, at this time, I don't know, maybe data science was a term, but uh, I referred to it as advanced analytics. And so I was using a little bit of coding um, and you know, along the way, I picked up SQL um, and was building models to uh, you know drive business value. And and I've worked in a couple different industries, and now I'm 
at Constant Contact doing data science. <laughs> So, so um, at what point, like you were doing data science before, like the, the term was kind of coined, like the sexiest job, right? At mm -hmm. what point did you decide, like, this is the career field for me? Like, was there a certain project you were working on or something that you were doing that you're like, yeah, this is something that I'm really enjoying. I, I want to, I'm not going to pursue academia anymore to be a professor. I want to stay in business. Yeah, so, you know, I, I'm incredibly passionate about mathematics and I absolutely love statistics, you know, and as, I don't know if it's because I'm a woman, but I've always sort of felt like I had something to prove, like I'm not gonna lie. And, um, you know, in that first job where I was building neural nets and, you know, I also did like a mathematical proof to show why um, our choice of T values greater than one in our model would reduce the forecasting error and therefore made it a more efficient model because we were, we had to make these submissions to the DPU. And I've always felt in the roles that I've been in highly valued. Um, I felt respected. I have felt, mm -hmm. um, you know, that other other people value my intelligence and that was something that was important to me was that you know I was able to use my brain think about problems in a way that a lot of times especially now more recently in my career is really out of the box and so all of those things uh, are really attractive to me the the you know, the fact that I have to really think that it's a skill set that not everyone has and that not, you know, everyone can um, both build models and easily distill that information for the business and, um, you know, really advocate for ways that we could be thinking about things uh, that, you know, could optimize a process or add value. So, you know, today's topic is, um you know, very, very important to our data science community because there's so many people who are just graduating from college or just finishing up some certificate courses and in, in something around data science. And um, one of the questions we get a lot is, you know, what, what are the most valuable skills to learn to help prepare you for a job working in data science? Yeah, so I don't think we talk about it enough, but SQL is, you know, if you have um, finished a degree in a quantitative field or you've taken some MOOCs and you haven't yet learned SQL, like you you need it. It is, it is a non-starter mm. because the majority of the models that you're going to build or the analyst analyst analysis that you're going to do um, is going to be on data that's probably living in a data warehouse. And, you know, you may be working with big data technologies, but, you know, even as an example, Hive is also a structured query language. So, um, you know, so it's applicable there too, you know, and, and in the real world, we don't just get data sets that are handed to us that are clean in the real world, we are joining across different tables in a database to structure the data the way that we need it to be for um, for analysis. And so if, if you don't have that ability to get in and self-serve and get that data yourself, you're, you're gonna be really hindered. Yeah, I don't think I've heard a lot of, I mean, SQL has been mentioned in previous broadcasts, but a lot of times people are focused on talking about programming languages like a, like R and Python. And yeah. so I'm really glad that you're talking about SQL as being one of the most important uh, languages to learn to help you with your structured data. Yep. I mean, because I, of course, I'm using R and Python every day because I, you know, have a problem where I can't uh, I can't make a choice I all my models were built in R up until probably six months ago and then I started making the move to Python and so now I've been doing a lot of coding in Python but I still um, leverage R every once in a while because I can't I just can't completely let go of it and sometimes <laughs> I also use RPy2 to call R through Python um, <laughs> but you know I think 
for being able to walk into a job when it is your day one. Like, what are you going to be doing? They're going to say, here's our database. And like, this is what you're going to be using to get the data to make your models. Like, um, so I think, you know, as much as we like to talk about cool technology and we certainly can do a lot of cool things like SQL, man. SQL. All right. You heard, <laughs> you heard it from Christian. SQL, man. I got to quote you on that. <laughs> it's all about SQL, man. <laughs> now, that's good. Um, I think I, I think that's really valuable um, advice for our community. Because like you said, day one, what are you going to be doing? Here's our data sets. You got to start playing around with it. You need to know SQL. And I don't think that is talked a lot. And that's something that we don't talk a lot about here in Data Talk. So thank you so much for, for sharing that. Um, you know, uh, recruiters get re really inundated with applications. And I'm on LinkedIn and pretty active there. So whenever there's jobs, like even here at Experian for data science roles, I'll get a lot of messages on LinkedIn. Hey, can you share my profile with a recruiter? And I'll talk to recruiters and they'll say they'll get like 300 resumes in a week for a data science role. And what advice would you have for somebody who is brand new, just starting out, they don't have any work experience to speak of? Um, how can they stand out in this pile of resumes or LinkedIn profiles that recruiters are looking at? What, what can help them? Yeah, so I think there's definitely ways that you can leverage LinkedIn in terms of, I don't think people think enough about, um, like you can go and connect with a recruiter and comment on his stuff. And not just when he has a, or she has a job posting available, like proactively go and engage in conversation and, and you know, add value for that person so that when you do go and you send him a, or her a, a message on LinkedIn, they know who you are. You're not just another random person who's messaging him. You know, you're the girl that has been been talking um, in his comments and he's interacted with you. And then the way that you position yourself on LinkedIn when you're reaching out to these people is you really want to make sure that you're not talking about what it is that you're looking for. You want to talk about how you believe that you fit that role. So if you reach out and you say, you know, I'm trying to think of how I say it because I do, I, you know, on my last job hunt, I absolutely was leveraging LinkedIn. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, you reach out and you say, hey, I've noticed this position. I'm a person who is skilled in Python, SQL, and mention some, you know, different types of modeling that you've done. And it can be from your coursework. You don't have to say it's from your coursework, but you just want to, you want to make sure that um, you get a response and that you get noticed, right? So we just want to position ourselves differently, um, you know, showing that you can, because if you can, um, write some Python and you can write some R and you can do some SQL and you can do some modeling. Like you don't need to say like, Oh, I, I learned this in school. You can just say, Hey, you know, I'm so-and-so I, I saw this position open and I'd love the opportunity to speak with the correct person. I'm looking to get my resume in the right hands. And I have experience with Python SQL data analysis um, and, and building models. And, you know, and I hope you'll you'll forward my resume to the appropriate person. But I think that, you know, and it's not going to work all the time. Uh, but I think that there's some things that you can be aware of and 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 really think strategically when you are going to reach out to these people. And if you can um, try and build a relationship before reaching out, that's all the better. Where do you. Um... I've seen some different comments and blogs, people talking about the value of posting your portfolio on GitHub. But I've also read some blog articles about GitHub's pointless for putting your portfolio. I'm kind of curious about your thoughts on uh, where to put your portfolio work as a data scientist. Yeah. So 
I mean, I have an enterprise GitHub. So if you were to check my personal GitHub, I don't even have uh, my projects there. However, I do mm-hmm. have a blog. Um, and so for anyone who's looking to really highlight their skills and abilities, if you know, if you want to go ahead and do it, start a blog. It is incredible for so each time you write an article, um, post it on LinkedIn, post it on Twitter. Um, you know, get get people's eyes on your blog. Don't just post it and leave it there, but share that article on LinkedIn. Um, and so not only because GitHub's for code, right? And you know, some comments and and a readme, but um, demonstrating that you were able to do these technical things and that you were able to talk to them in a way that other people can read is a highly valued skill. And, you know, I only started my blog in March and it has opened up a ton of opportunities Mm. for me. Like I can't even speak to it enough. Mm. That's awesome to hear. Uh, And we just actually got a question here on Facebook live um, from a software engineer Mm -hmm. and he's asking, um, the software engineer is looking to break into data, the data science world. And what do you suggest for professionals like us? Yeah. So I get that question a lot, especially from people who have just finished a CS degree and they want to get a job in computer science. And, and my thought is always to, you know, take, take a CS job because they're no joke. They pay well. Um, you can find fantastic jobs in computer engineering. Uh, it's in, in, you know, it's not talked about as much as like, you know, they talk about data science is a hot topic, but, <laughs> um, you know, people are clawing to get at developers mm-hmm. and, you know, as you're working as a developer, you can take some MOOCs at night to get that, machine learning piece. And then when you go to position things on your resume, there's certain things that you're already doing that are of huge value to a business if they are looking for a data scientist, things like automating processes. Um, You know, think like you're just, so you're able to take uh, MOOCs at night and and learn a couple skills and put them on your resume and then just start applying and working on the way that you're marketing yourself because the marketing yourself for a, a data science position is like a huge piece of it. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, with a CS background, you're in a fantastic spot to hop into the field. My boss um, was from a CS background. I know a number of people from CS backgrounds who make the move and they're, you know, having the CS first is kind of gives you a leg up. Uh, you know, you just mentioned about just the importance of continuing to learn and I was kind of curious, I do see lots of posts on LinkedIn uh, about different boot camps, data science boot camps that are out there, uh, courses on Udemy, Coursera. I'm kind of curious about your your view of those different types of courses and, and how you view the certifications of those courses. Are those valuable? So. I don't necessarily see the certification, like the paper itself Mm -hmm. as valuable. Um, Certainly add it to your LinkedIn, because why not? Maybe don't add it to your resume, because that is um, prime real estate that you need to really uh, think strategically. You only have one page. I I don't like it when I see two page resumes. Um, Mm. But in terms of, you know, the courses themselves, yeah, highly valuable. I actually asked on LinkedIn a while ago um, for people to suggest their favorite ones. And, you know, there's a Python A to Z course that everyone recommends. So you can see um, the courses that other people recommend, right? Social proof. and try and take ones that are good because some of them, you know, not not all uh, courses are created equal, but I've personally taken a MOOC on Git. I've taken a MOOC on Python. And, uh, you know, when I decided to make the hop from R to Python, I started with a MOOC. I also used um, Code Wars, um, which is free. But, you know, I was able to learn dust 
a little bit about web scraping, about uh, writing to a database. Now, I had been using databases for years, but and you know, and I had helped um, move data that was not in an, in a, a great schema or there was just like a bunch of snowflake tables i had i had helped in the transition of how to structure that data as we moved over to a star schema but i had never actually written to a database so you know i i feel like i pick up uh little nuggets of awesomeness mm -hmm. sort of everywhere and you know, even this far in my career, I'm still always every month or two taking a new MOOC to just, uh, I don't know, I just find them fascinating. I love that after my kids go to sleep, I can watch some video um, and and learn something new, but that's just part of my personality. Is there um, certain uh, online classrooms you recommend over others? Because like I said, there are so many boot camps that are out there. And I was just kind of curious when you did your um, your question on LinkedIn to your community uh, and you just mentioned one of those courses, uh, was that on Coursera? Was it on Udemy? Do you yeah. have to remember? So, so um, the course that I took, Python for Everybody, is on Coursera. Uh, most of the courses that I have taken are on Coursera because it always, to me, I liked the fact that it was coming from an accredited university. But at the same time, I've heard other people's opinions on other courses as well. And I can't say that I know all there is about, um, you know, sort of the landscape and who is out there. I just know that they are valuable. Um, you know, I... I actually thought about taking a boot camp the last time I was switching jobs. I was thinking about becoming a full stack developer. Um, but of course I stayed in data science because that's uh, sort of where my heart is. But just the idea of taking, you know, a couple weeks off of, um, you know, the job search and, and learning something new just sounded like so much fun. Um, but yeah, definitely. Sorry, can't uh, can't help anymore with with helping to narrow down the most um, useful platforms. But I have always had luck with Coursera, and it's worked for me. Nice. Well, I got another question here on Facebook Live. Hey, Kristen, I want to know what are some of the tools that I can learn and practice SQL and T SQL from? Yeah. So I think right. So. The first, uh, the first option is always to take a MOOC. Uh, secondly, you know, I think a lot of people don't realize that SQLite is open source, and so you can download that. You can find um, different data sources. Whether you go into Kaggle, some of those are, are a lot of times really large. I'm trying to think of. I'd seen a really great uh, data website before that it aggregated a ton of uh, Kyle McHugh on um, on LinkedIn. He has an article that he lists like 20 free online courses or something mm. or 20 um, data science resources. And, and number 20 was a website that had a ton of um, free data that it was just there. And it was Ooh. like this huge site. It, this per, this person had like aggregated a bunch of data resources. But yeah, I mean, you can set up SQLite, you can download data, and now you are playing in there for free. And of course, there's, there's YouTube tutorials um, if you didn't want to actually take a MOOC. But there are absolutely MOOCs out there for specifically learning SQL and T-SQL. Awesome. So, um what are some common interview questions that a new data scientist should be prepared to answer when going in for a job interview? Absolutely. I mean, so there, when you get the phone screen and you pick up the phone, they're going to say, <laughs> hi, Kristen, uh, is this still a good time to talk? And you say yes. And then they're going to say, OK, great. I have your resume in front of me. Can you please tell me a little bit about yourself? And so here, you don't want to give away the farm. Uh, you're just <laughs> looking to 
show that you can explain who you are in a concise sort of way. I typically go with something along the lines of, you know, I'm a data scientist with eight years of experience uh, working across healthcare, the utility industry, and I'm currently in e-commerce. And, you know, I have a master's degree in statistics and a ton of experience building different models that I'd like to tell you about. You know, like it's just mm. like three lines, you know, so that was sort of off the cuff. I haven't interviewed in like over six months. So um, not my best work, but you get the idea. Um, <laughs> yeah, and yeah, then, yeah. <laughs> and then it's like your um, elevator pitch. I like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have to get, have the elevator pitch ready. Um, and then the other questions that you, I mean, there's really four specific ones, and I'm sure I'll only be able to remember three. But, um, you know, tell me about a time with a difficult stakeholder and how it was resolved. Tell me about a time um, that you explained technical material to a non-technical audience. Um, yeah, can't remember the other two, but they're in my one of my blog posts. Um, mm -hmm. And I was asked these same questions over and over again. And so those are the behavioral questions that you're supposed to answer in the star format. So you, you know, clearly give sort of some context and background, talk about the problem, talk about the solution um, and, you know, and the results. And then, you know, of course, end it with, and that is a time that I worked with a difficult stakeholder. <laughs> mm. And I'm going to make sure to, uh, after this episode is over, to link over to that blog post that you just mentioned with those four questions. And for those listening to the podcast, the URL is ex.pn slash data talk 55. And that is a place where I'll go ahead and put the links to Kristen's article for those that are interested in these those behavioral questions, those four key questions that get asked quite a bit. I think those will be really valuable to go over. And I think the one that you mentioned that I thought is really interesting is about the communication aspect. Communicating something that's very technical to somebody who's not familiar with that jargon. Can you talk about how important that communication is for the data scientist? Oh my God, it's so incredibly important. Like I, I pretty much promise you that if you have four interviews with four different companies, you will be asked this question at least once, if not more. Um, you know, and I think that when we talk about data science, a lot of times, you know, if somebody said to you, What's a data scientist? A lot of people are going to say, well, it's somebody who writes code, maybe production level code. It's somebody who builds models. It's somebody who does analysis. But like the big pil pillar of that is also business acumen. Um, and I see data science as a very cross functional interdisciplinary field where I am routinely working across all sorts of departments to understand their needs so that those can be inputs into my model. Because if I build out this beautiful cluster analysis, but I hadn't talked to other areas of the business, um, it may not be something that they want or need. So, you know, you're getting buy-in first across, across the organization and, um, you know, that having that buy-in is what allows you to have value. And then at the end, you know, after I build a model, I'm always presenting that model afterwards. Um, and, you know, I'm not talking about the Fourier transforms that were used to determine whether or not a customer was seasonal. You know, I'm talking <laughs> about what percentage of our customer base was identified to have seasonal patterns and what do these seasonal customers look like? Um, you know, and, and so when I answer the technical question myself on the interview, I typically start with, I give this example from when I was working at Vistaprint and, you know, so at Vistaprint, I was asked to do a behavioral uh, cluster analysis of our digital customer base, 
But when it came time to talk to the stakeholders, I brought it up a level. And so I'm clearly telling the person that I'm talking to that I was bringing it up a level. I was like, I brought it up a level. I wasn't talking about the methodology. I was talking about the size of the opportunity and the behaviors that each of those clusters had. So I wasn't talking about hierarchical clustering or PAM. Like I was talking about you know, we have this group of high spenders who are very highly engaged. They're, they're utilizing all of, um, you know, the resources at their disposal to get in contact with us if they need help and, and other things and talking about, you know, the other groups. Um, and, and so that's, you know, the picture that I paint during the interview for this person when I'm asked, you know, how did I explain that, that, technical concept to a non-technical person. And the answer is I brought it up a level and I talked about the opportunity, yada, yada, yada. I love that. I love that. So <laughs> when you've done, I mean, cause that's a, that's a huge skill to, to, to t talk about something very, very technical and then bring it up to a level where it's going to be what you're saying is going to be vitally important to the business leaders. Mm -hmm. because they don't care necessarily about the model or no. the algorithms you're working with. They care about the insights and how it's going to help grow their business. Right. Yep. And so for you to be able to talk to that level is going to be crucial for your success as a data scientist. Um, have you ever, while presenting, had to deal with pushback from, from leaders? Like they didn't agree with your results. Did, did that ever happen? I'm trying to think. Um, I mean, there's always questions and yeah. feedback, you know, um, especially when you are presenting to senior leadership and you're a data scientist and you're um, uh, you report up through, you know, maybe marketing, maybe a different department or whatever. But if you are uh, presenting to an area of the business and senior leadership that's sort of outside of your wheelhouse, like they're absolutely going to have questions about things that you maybe haven't thought of. And that comes mm. back to uh, getting that widespread buy-in that'll help to mitigate some of that proactively, but absolutely, um, you know, people are going to have questions and they're going to challenge you. And that doesn't mean that what you did was wrong. It's an opportunity to look at your analysis another way and maybe improve it or maybe um, add an extra dimension to it to help fully explain the story. Cool. Well, uh, I know our, our time is up. I have just one last question and I actually found this question on Quora uh, from a bunch of people who were wondering. And the question was, what do experienced data scientists know that beginner data scientists don't know? Oh, so much. Um, <laughs> you know, well, because I, I speak to a lot of people and when I've hired in the past, um, yeah, you just don't realize how much you know until you have to break it down. Because really, um, especially since we were already talking about presentations, I think that that is one of the big pain points is that most people out of school who start their job in data science, um, they don't know how to write a deck effectively. It's not one of those things that was covered in school. Maybe if um, their background is in business, maybe you got it, but if, um, if you came out of a statistics uh, or a CS background, I'd bet the farm that your your first <laughs> isn't gonna be pretty and uh you know and it's and it's that same idea it's that we're not um like in grad school we spend a lot of slides talking about the methodology that we used because that was correct for that audience and and now in business the audience has changed and and our pr our presentations need to be structured to reflect that so starting with a high level overview talking about only the insights that are important and not necessarily the details that went into it and finishing with a summary and talking about your next steps um, 
and you know, including nice visuals and maybe using a branded template um, and the verbiage. Uh, but yeah, I've seen some really bad presentations. And um, if I was going to, you know, pick one thing, because because people will pick up um, the technical things, and maybe you haven't had the opportunity to build the type of model that uh, you know is the best solution for the project at hand, but you know, there's also opportunities where, you know, I'm going to be leveraging new methodology uh, and I'm going to research that even though I'm nine years in. So, you know, that's something that's constantly growing and evolving. But um, yeah, presentation skills. So this has been a wonderful discussion, Kristen. Super valuable to me, to our community, because there are so many people who are trying to get their foot in the door to become a data scientist and all the things you've shared in today's episode is just super valuable. I wanna let everybody know that uh, Kristen's available on LinkedIn. Kristen, where can people uh, follow you, reach out to you? Where's the best spot for you'd like for them to go? Yeah, so I have a blog. It is Data Moves Me. And so I'm pretty active on my blog. And uh, also you can find me on LinkedIn and I'd say that that's probably where I'm the most active. Okay, is it datamovesme.com? Yes. Okay, perfect. I just put that URL on the screen. Check Kristen out, uh, engage with her posts there. And like I said, uh, I'm gonna be putting a link to her LinkedIn profile on the Experian blog. And again, the URL is just ex.pn slash datatalk55. And we'll have a link to her LinkedIn profile, uh, to her website, as well as uh, her article that she wrote about the common questions that you'll get when you're interviewing to become a data scientist. Kristen, thank you so much for your time today. Uh, we actually got tons of questions in the queue. Unfortunately, we couldn't get to them all. So if you do have questions for Kristen, please go to her blog, post them there, reach out to her and uh, network with her and follow her definitely. Kristen, thank you so much for your time today. All righty, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate okay, take care. it. Okay, you too. Take care.